What we pretend we can't see by Jason. Chapter 13 Harry wakes up in a hospital bed alone. Well, no, not alone. There's a Maddie wizard in with him, and then a healer. They tell him that he lost a lot of blood, but the wound missed his splenic artery by a hair, and that they're keeping him overnight, but he's going to be fine. There isn't even going to be a scar, which Harry thinks is a little unfair, since Draco is stuck with that thin line of silver down his cheek for all eternity. Still, it's good news, and he's glad to hear it. Ron comes in a few minutes later, and then Hermione, and then the full complement of Weasley saving Charlie, who Bill says is still off in parts unknown. Harry talks and laughs with them for a while, wondering where Draco is. None of them seems to know, though Ron assures him that he was with Blaze, and in this very hospital last he laid eyes on him, and that he's sure Draco's fine and Harry shouldn't worry about it. Harry can't help but worry about it, of course. He wonders if maybe, after everything, the kissing, sure, but also the bleeding and the death threats, and finding out Harry's apparently a master of Grimmer Place again, if Draco just decided he didn't want to deal with it any more. If it turned out to be too much risk, after all. The house knows how Master Draco's feeling, Harry thinks, and hopes, hopes, hopes. Eventually, everyone clears out. Visiting hours are over, the healer tells Ginny, when she tries gamely to hide behind a potted plant, and Harry sits alone in the dark and listens to his own breathing, wonders what Draco's doing right now. It's, he should be here. Harry can't believe that he isn't here, and he's so occupied with trying to figure out where or why he might have gone that it takes him longer than it should to realize he's listening to the sound of two people breathing, not one. You know, Harry says to the empty room, nicking my stuff is technically a crime. There's a beat of silence, and then Draco sighs and pulls off Harry's invisibility cloak. He's leaning against the table at Harry's bedside, and he looks down to make a sour face at Harry that Harry is almost certain is mostly for show. You shouldn't just leave it hanging on the coat rack if you don't want people to borrow it. I didn't, Harry says amused, his heart pounding in his chest. Maybe it's all the new blood running through his veins, but he feels alive. Suddenly, in this way, he hasn't in a long time, looking up at Draco's well-loved little scout. Oh, I left it folded up inside my work bag, where I always leave it, and where you found it by snooping around like the snake you are. Draco shrugs and drops down into the chair next to Harry's bed. Maybe I didn't much fancy discussing the whole ordeal with every Weasley known to man. Did you consider that possibility? And it's not as though you were using it, after all. You could have just gone home, Harry points out. I left me here under the Weasley's watchful eyes. He's fishing, and he knows it, and he doesn't care. Draco's been sitting in his room under his invisibility cloak for hours, probably, was clearly planning on just staying and watching Harry all night. He took Harry to the Glen. He let Harry move in. He kissed Harry back, and then kissed him again. He didn't want Harry to die. The house knows how Draco feels, and Harry's pretty sure that he does too. Harry's pretty sure that they both do, and he can be patient if that's what Draco needs from him, but he's had a hard day. There's no harm in fishing a little. The smile Draco gives him is small, a little crescent of rueful admission curling the corners of his mouth. Quietly he says, I don't think I could, actually, tragically enough. Harry grins wide and stupid, and is so happy he could burst when Draco seems to startle a bit at the expression before he flushes and ducks his head. Don't look at me like that. God, you'll put someone off their dinner. No one else is in here, Harry says, except you, that is, and you want to know the truth, Draco. I think you like it. I think the symptoms of blood loss must include hallucinations, Draco tells him earnestly. Severe ones? Be honest. I look like a crap to you right now, don't I? No, Harry says, and doesn't let his smile dim a single degree. Doesn't think he could, even if he wanted to. He don't. Draco gives him a hard look, gaze sharp, even in the darkness, and then, in a voice that's trying too hard for casual, says, Look, Potter. You've obviously been through an ordeal. Please, I'm fine, Harry says. It's not even the worst time I've been stabbed. A couple of years ago, there was this thing with spammy. Draco holds up his hand. His face is painted. 
most people, you know, don't respond to a life-threatening attack with a list of comparable attacks they've survived. That's not right, Harry. Have the decency to seem taken aback by the whole thing, at the very least. Uh, Harry says, okay. He looks around for a minute, and because he might as well make an attempt, tries, man, it's so strange to be here, in this hospital, and stabbed and all. How bizarre. You're a hopeless dolt, Draco says, a slight smile playing at the edges of his mouth. He leans forward, rests his arm on Harry's bed, pillows his head atop them, and looks at Harry sideways. I lied, you know. About what? Why I was under the cloak. Draco closes his eyes briefly, punches out a harsh breath before he opens them again. I was quite sure that if you could see me, you'd immediately start asking me questions, and I'm very tired, you see. I was up all last night because, well... He winces and sits up enough to free one of his hands, just just broadly with it. I'm sure you recall. It's not fair, you know, to make me have conversation about all that right now. I might as well be under Veritas Arum. It's been so long since I've slept. I can't be held responsible for my actions, and it's wrong, unjust, to press your advantages like this. Prickly little git. I throw tightens, just looking at him. The brittleness that's crept into the set of his shoulders and the sound of his voice. Heaven forbid he just ask Harry to leave it alone like a normal person. No, he's obviously got a level of false accusation. Though it twits his heart a little to think it, Harry wonders if Draco's ever made it more than a few minutes with his armor down. He thinks the answer is probably no. Oh, I'm not making you do anything, Malfoy. Harry says mild instead of any of this. Oh, I'm just sitting here. Laying here. Whatever. Don't think that gets you off the hook, Draco says. It's nonsense, and as if to underscore this, he yawns hugely after the last word, grimacing when he stops. Merlin. Yeah, Harry says, catching his yawn. You should go home and sleep. I already said I wouldn't, Draco snaps, and I won't. Stop pressing it. Honestly, the stubbornness, it's unbelievable, like a dog with a bone. So, to be clear here. Harry interrupts before Draco can launch into a proper rant about how stubborn Harry is and be struck dead of sheer hypocrisy halfway through. You won't go home, but you don't want to talk about anything, and I'm on the hook for anything we do talk about, even if you bring it up. That's the long and short of it, yes. So, Harry says, grinning slightly, stand at play, then. Draco rolls his eyes, but Harry thinks he looks relieved anyway. Oh, piss off, Potter. They sit in companionable silence for a few minutes, listening to the hum of the hospital working on outside the door, and Harry finds that Draco's right. He does want to ask a bunch of questions. He's not sure any of them are the right questions. In fact, he rather doubts it, but they're lining up in his mind anyway, one after the other, jostling for the first position. Draco, Harry says slowly, what if, I mean... What I just asked one. Oh my god, I knew it, Draco groans. I knew you couldn't just let sleeping dogs lie. I bet you wake real sleeping dogs, actually. I bet you go run to people's houses and they let you in. Little knowing your dastardly plants, thinking you're perfectly trustworthy because you're Harry Potter and they've never actually met you before. Then they have to look on in horrors as you awaken their peacefully sleeping canine companions. Cruelly, for sport. Harry shrug. It's a hobby. Draco stares at him for a second, but then he laughs. He is tired. Even if Harry couldn't see it in the circle under his eyes, he can hear it in the rasp of a chuckle, the way it pulls thin and strained from the back of Draco's throat. God, fine, one question. At the cost of your being banned from asking anything further until at least tomorrow. What is it? What cannot wait until you no longer look quite so much like you emptied half your blood onto my kitchen floor? What is so pressing that must be answered before I have the opportunity to indulge in the sweet release of sleep? Eh, uh, Harry says, and he shouldn't ask it. It actually is doing what Draco accused him of, pressing his advantage, using Draco's exhaustion as if it's veritas serum. But he wants to know. Why? Why didn't you tell me? About the call. Draco scrapes the chair back and stands up abruptly. 
while stung second, Harry thinks he's going to walk right out of the room, not even saying goodbye. Thinks he's going to do, for all intents and purposes, what he ended up doing the last time Harry asked him this question, but he doesn't. He walks to the window instead, stares out in the night for a moment, and, not without bitterness, says, You couldn't have gone with something easier. Then, perhaps remembering the full complement of other things they haven't discussed, hastily adds, Don't answer that. Harry doesn't. He just sits quietly, watching the line of Draco's back, until Draco turns around and leans against the glass to regard him. I don't know, he says finally. When Harry raises his eyebrows, he holds up a hand. No, stop, that's not my whole answer, but it's an answer anyway, I really don't. At first, it was like I said. I didn't think someone who treated grown-up place like you had deserved to know that kind of secret. Nobody's known where the core in that house is for years. I don't think Auntie or Bulger even did. I only found it because I, well, it's something a bit mental to figure it out, Harry suggests. His voice is gentler than he means it to be, and he winces when Draco glares at him. You don't have to tell me, you know. Where it is, I mean. I'm not asking for that. Well, good, because you're not getting it, Draco says. Arch. His voice drops back into a more normal register, though, as he adds, But yes, I did something a bit mental, and it worked, and I liked that it worked. I liked being the only one who knew. So I think uh, some of it was that too, which is stupid, honestly. All the reasons I can come up with are stupid. I just didn't. That's the answer. I was going to, and then, after the second attack, you came to stay, and I... He stops talking, fixes his gaze firmly on the ground. I wanted to solve the case, obviously. It was killing me. I was terrified for the house. My life, but maybe. I, I don't know. Harry can't be sure, but he thinks it's possible, not likely, but possible, that Draco is saying he didn't tell Harry about the call because it might have solved the case for them and given Harry a reason to go home. And that's Harry can't believe. There are fifteen things he wants to say, but every one of them has an inherent question attached. That big, looming truth they're both not touching, and Harry promised he'd only asked one. Okay, he says. And Draco's head whips up, his eyes wide with surprise, Harry laughs. Oh, mean, don't do it again or anything. Bloody stupid, nearly got you killed. Nearly got you killed, you mean? Draco mutters as he moves to drop back into his chair again. Harry shrugs. Oh, I don't mind. Do you know? Draco draws, rolling his eyes. Oh, I think that's actually true. And it might be the worst thing about you, Harry, which is really saying something. The bar is incredibly high. I mean, it's a disconnection from your own mortality on par with have I ever shared with you the truly appalling details of Archibald to archaic private's writings? Don't think so, Harry says, even though he knows Draco's just trying to distract him. That's fine. Draco's tired. And if he's honest, Harry's too. They can deal with the rest of this tomorrow. Why don't you tell me about it? Draco does, and Harry must fall asleep to the soothing rise and fall of his voice, because when he wakes up, there's sunlight slipping through the window, and Draco's out cold asleep in his chair, his head a warm weight against Harry's thigh. His hair's loose, knocked askew, and his eyes again, and Harry, half awake and curious, reaches out a hand to, Don't touch my hair, Potter, Draco says without opening his eyes. How ye? Harry says, snatching his hand back, and then hastily corrects. I mean, I wasn't. He's a little horrified with himself, in fact, that he even got halfway through the gesture. Now that he's more alert, he can recognize it's probably weird to, whatever, to roll someone's hair under your fingertips just to see what it feels like, or stroke it back out of their eyes. He's not sure if either of these things are what he was planning on doing exactly, but he can recognize that two desperate, Heat of the moment kisses don't give him permission to just go, touching whenever he likes. Draco's eyes open, but barely. Holds them narrowed and suspicious. How do you feel? Ah, uh, Harry says, blinking at him. I guess I'm hungry. Sighing heavily, Draco sits up. I meant, how do you feel since yesterday a distressing amount of your blood quit your body for the floor of my kitchen? But sure, hungry, all right. Let you sleep all night like that. Harry cocks his head in interest as Draco stretches and winces, cracks his neck. I don't think that's good for your back. Better than having a knife stuck in it, Draco says, smiling nastily. I win. He settles back in his chair, and before Harry can argue, 
and Mediwitch, Hermione, and one walk through the door. Mr. Potter, the Mediwitch says warmly, good to see you awake, of course. I'm sure that Hida Mentor hey, has taken excellent care of you. I was just saying to Aura Weasley here how incredible it must be to have a healer from foreign parts at your beck and call because of your war efforts. A lot of very interesting things were said, Ron agrees, giving Malfoy his best. We've got you dead to rights, look. Many things of considerable interest have been said this morning. I, for one, was very shocked to hear about your extensive celebrity clientele. What can I say? The healing, it is my calling, says Malfoy, apparently totally unperturbed by one's glare, in a French accent so pronounced it would put Fleurs to shame. And to work with Harry Potter is, how you say, insufferable? I believe the word you mean is incredible. Poor dear, English is a bit tricky, says the Mediwitch absently, as she busies herself with casting an assortment of diagnostic spells on Harry. You don't mind if I check your work, do you, he lament her? I'm sure you're very capable, but since he's in our hospital and all... Be my guest, Draco says, just as Hermione, voice all pointed amusement, says, Did you know, Harry, that menteur means liar in French? Harry gives up and laughs, long and hard enough, but the Medivitch starts fretting that perhaps one of the potions has gone wrong, and Draco has to start waving his arms around and explaining, half in French, that hysteria is a side effect from an old war wound, and she's being terribly rude by bringing it up. She hurries out, and Harry laughs some more when Draco drops the accent at once, draws, What, Weasley? I had to do something. The wretched woman tried to kick me out. Are you going to arrest me for impersonating a healer? Oh, I should arrest you on grounds of personality alone, Ron mutters, though he sits down in a chair without moving towards Draco. Some poor bastard has to have encountered your whole thing before. You can't be the first person in all of history to be this mad. Maybe they were smart enough to put some laws down to protect the rest of us. Alas, says Draco, I've searched the annals of history for myself, and the closest I've ever found is a chap called Wildercombe from the late twelfth century. Harry starts laughing again. The guy from the second floor drawing room, Draco, the hypothetical magic guy. Wildercombe was very committed to his craft, Potter, Draco says. He raises his eyebrows and crosses his arms, expression stern. And while, yes, I will grant you his methods were a little unorthodox, he burned down three forests. Harry hopes this incredulity is written on his face. Half of the exhibit is a tapestry of him yelling while a room full of servants cover their ears. Two forests and a small orchard, and it was intended to be hypothetical. I think the important thing is to focus on all the forests he didn't burn down, Draco says. And anyway, the point is, he did whatever was necessary, even if everyone around him did think he was mental. He is my kindred spirit, the brother of my soul. You've been committing arson, Malfoy. Ron says, giving Draco a speculative look. Well, that's a serious offence, that is. I was just kidding before, but maybe we should bring you in for questioning. Draco darts a panically glance at Harry. Potter, control your man, he is. The iron has gone to his... Oh my god, wait, are you joking? Of course I'm joking, Ron says, grinning broadly. You can't expect me to go without taking any shorts, can you? I had to talk him out of buying a ferret for exactly this reason the other day. Hermione says, patting one on the arm. Petty childhood grudges are well enough, I'm sure, but we're all the adults, and they do have such terrible smell. We do not talk, says Draco, his voice several pitches higher than normal, about the ferret incident. Then he scrapes his chair back and stalks out of the room without another word. Shit, says Ron, looking after him uncomfortably. Or oh, just wanted to rattle his cage a little. I didn't actually mean to, you know, draw anything up. Please. Harry says, rolling his eyes. Oh, he's fine. He's just trying to make you feel guilty so you'll do stuff for him later. See if I get you a coffee now, Potter, comes Draco's voice, vengeful from the hall. My coffee, no breakfast, Harry calls back, even though he doesn't know if he'll even be out of here in time to cook. He's rewarded with a string of expletives that switch to French halfway through, if also forced to endure identical long-suffering looks from Ron and Hermione. Unsurprisingly, the Mediwitch Draco tricked walks in a second later, followed by Harry's actual healer, the middle-aged witch who clearly has better things to do than be here dealing with this. She clears Harry to go home, though she orders him off active duty for a week, 
and after they've gone and Harry's changed into regular clothes, he, Ron and Hermione, sit on the bed to wait for Draco to return. Sorry you guys came all the way up here, Harry says a little awkwardly, since I'm, you know, leaving and everything. Don't be ridiculous, Harry. Of course we came, Hermione says. He puts a hand on his arm, even as Ron knocks his shoulder against Harry's. We were worried about you, and you'd do the same for us. Well, sure, Harry says. What? He stops, looks at the wan exacerbation on Hermione's face and the badly hidden winds on Ron's and bites back. It's different when it's me. Anyway, thanks. It's nice to have you here. Sorry we didn't pretend to be your foreign medical team, Hermione says dry, then carefully. So, Draco really slept here all night? Yeah, Harry says. Oh, well, I think so, anyway. Well, I suppose he could have left while I was asleep and come back. Still, though, Ron says with an approving little nod. Well, that's the right way to go about it. Stand by your partner and all. You didn't tell anyone you were my personal friend Sheila when I was in the hospital, Hermione says, affecting a wounded air. The romance is clearly dead. Oi, says Ron. Oh, I didn't have to tell people I was bloody French healer. I'm an aura. They didn't try to make me leave. What's more romantic, a lying little git or an upstanding man of the law. So, Harry, Hermione says, ignoring one's outraged little noise at being ignored. You and Draco talked it all out then. Uh, says Harry. You know, Hermione presses, your feelings and what you're going to do about them and where you stand with each other. Uh, says Harry again. Oh, Harry, Hermione says, despairing, you have to talk about these things. All good relationships are built on communication. Oh, I think me and Draco communicate all right, Harry says, and looks at his hands. It just takes a while sometimes. I don't want to force anything, you know. Or count my chickens. He, I think that he, oh, I don't know. He offers a small, slightly rueful smile. Can we just leave it for now? I promise I'll tell you if anything, you know, changes or whatever. Sure, Harry. Ron says firmly and then cranes his neck in a way. What Harry knows without looking means he's giving Hermione a quailing look over the top of Harry's head. We can be respectful and restrained, can't we, Hermione? Oh, fine, Hermione says begrudgingly. And so help me, Harry, if you don't tell me. Tell you what, Draco says returning. He hands Harry a cup of coffee and then raises his eyebrows at Ron. Uh, sorry, Weasley, Wild Ferret attacked me on the way back up here. He drank yours. And mine too, I suppose, says Hermione, sounding amused as Ron scowls. You're with child, Draco says, waving a hand. You shouldn't be drinking coffee anyway, and especially not the foul swill they sell here. He takes a sip and shudders. Honestly, it's dreadful. You should be thanking me. Harry takes a sip of his own coffee and grimaces though a little part of him is warm to know that Draco remembers how he takes it. God, yuck. I've been cleared anyway, let's just go ho- uh, back to Grimmel Place. I've got real coffee there. Good lord, yes, Draco says, tossing his cup into the trash at once. Why didn't you say, you horror, I drank half of it? Before you go, says Ron, and his tone draws every gaze in the room. He squares his shoulders. Oh, I wanted to make sure I told you. Slughorn talked. He talked yesterday too, Draco says, his face darkening at Slughorn's name. He starts to move towards Harry, but his eyes flick to Ron and Hermione, flanking him on either side, and he stops, holds himself still. I suppose I should be grateful. As his inability to shut up and get on with it probably saved my life, but I'll admit I'm not feeling charitable towards the man at the moment. That makes two of us, Harry mutters. Four, in fact, Hermione says. But, well, he gave up his partner, and they brought her in. The various other accomplices will take a little longer to track down, but they weren't involved in the planning, and shouldn't try anything on their own. We thought you both might be happier knowing it's really over. What, the woman who attacked you? Harry demands. Who was it? Hermione sighs. Do you remember Marietta Edgecomb? Uh, says Harry. Who knows that he should? The name sounds familiar. I say, Draco says, sounding shocked, I do. She's that girl you disfigured for tattling on your underground fighting club in fifth year. I didn't disfigure her. Hermione's voice is sharp, though Harry thinks it would be a lot sharper if she could see Ron mouthing. 
she did, bloody terrifying woman, even then. The way Harry can out of the corner of his eye. I warned everyone that there was a curse on that list, and she didn't choose to heed my warning. She just figured herself. Do you know, Granger? Draco says, his tone genuinely warm. You might have done well in Slytherin. Obviously, these two hopeless imbeciles would have been drowned within their first week if the sorting had suffered some sort of fit and sorted them snake, but you, you have potential. Harry decides with a quiet delight he feels to his toes that he will wait that Draco that the sorting hat wanted him for Slytherin until he really deserves the reaction it's bound to elicit. Maybe for his birthday. God, this is going to be hilarious. I am going to choose to take this as a compliment, Hermione says. Oh, I'm not, says Ron, giving Draco a dark look. Anyway, since apparently it's hard to get a normal job with snake written across your face and giant postures forever. I want her, Hermione says, and she shouldn't have told. So you became a head wizard? Ron shrugs at Harry a little helplessly. So we weren't totally wrong, at least. It was a professional job. Stockholm just used her expertise to his own ends. He offered her twice her usual fee, plus that stuff she looted at the first break-in. She was wearing that necklace when we picked her up. Oh, I guess old Sluggy figured he'd have money to spare after he took over your place. She was apparently quite pleased to get the chance to assault me. Hermione says, her hand flying up to worry at the faint scarring across her nose under her left eye. Her exact words were, a happy bonus. How do you have that interview transcript already? Ron groans, dropping his hat into his hands. I swear, Hermione, you have to stop doing that, or the lads will talk about how my wife and justice get special treatment. But she doesn't, Ronald, Hermione says. She just actually bothers to know where things are filed, which is more than can be said for you and your team. Harry stands up, figuring he might as well leave them to their bickering, which they continue without breaking stride. He meets Draco's eyes. So, Harry says. Oh, I guess it's really over. Like hell it is, Draco snaps. You promised me breakfast and coffee. Gaps Harry by the sleeve and pulls him towards the door. It's the strangest breakfast of Harry's life. By all accounts, it shouldn't be. As a life, Harry's has been a lot of things. But it's never been long on normalcy. Even his breakfast history is bizarre, featuring dozens of meals eaten in places he never would have expected meals to be found. The taste of freedom that morning at the Weasleys, when he was twelve after Fron, Fred and George broke him out after Dursays. The bagel he ate, still shaking and bloodstained in Earhart's office after his first case gone wrong. Hell, that first breakfast with Draco in Harry's apartment, talking about palaces under the Thames and the nature of magical structure. One of them should be weirder than this, Harry knows. This is just him and Draco sitting across from each other at the kitchen table, as they have every morning for weeks now, and it shouldn't be unusual at all. It doesn't matter. It's the strangest breakfast of Harry's life, whether there's logic to that or not. They talk about something. God, nothing important anyway, whatever it is. Harry is not paying attention to the conversation, even as he's having it. His words fall out of his mouth in reply to Draco's ranting, and then forgets them instantly, as if they were never there at all. He doesn't taste his food, he doesn't even look at his food, just shovels it in blindly into his mouth as his eyes flick to Draco's hands, away again to his cheekbones, to the pattern of tile on the floor. Every breath he draws feels a little heavier than regular air, and Harry thinks wildly of Bernice and the love potions. He wonders if this is what it feels like to be in one's grip, the scrabbling, sharp-clawed desperation under every inch of his skin or if this is worse for being the real thing. He doesn't say so. He doesn't ask. He just sits there and looks at Draco, and then away again, and tries not to think of the yawning void of uncertainty that will open between them the moment they lay down their forks. They have to, eventually, of course. Harry places his across his plate with care, and then looks up to see his own dread anticipation reflected back at him on Draco's face. It's enough to startle a laugh out of him, and Draco blinks, but then he chuckles too, ruefully, shaking his head. Look, Potter, he says and rubs briefly at his forehead. I know it's only half ten, and you're, I mean, a recent survivor of a brutal attack and all, but can we 
Would you like a drink? God, yes, Harry says at once. Thank Merlin, Draco says, and they both push back from the table. Harry's expecting Draco to lead him up to their study, to the study. Harry reminds himself with a frantic, scrambling haste. It's the study, not theirs in any way. But he takes them to the parlor instead, pulls a dusty bottle off a shelf and summons two glasses. There is no point in having the good stuff, Draco says when Harry raises his eyebrows, if you can't identify a circumstance that truly calls for it. We have, I'm afraid, found ourselves in one of those ignoble moments. Do I even want to know what this is? Harry asks, peering down into the glass, Draco hands to him. The liquid inside is the deep amber he associates with really excellent fire whiskey, but there's an iridescent quality to it he's never seen before. The smell, too, is both familiar and somehow not quite. Draco smiles. Suffice to say, it's odd enough and rare enough that if you don't savour it, it'll be very cross. Harry considers throwing back the entire glass in one swig just to irritate him, but only briefly. Whatever it is they've spun between them these last few months, it feels too fragile in this moment for that kind of game. He takes a small, slow sip instead, rolling the whiskey around on his tongue. It's rich and heady, and unlike anything he's ever tasted, and when he swallows the sensation is more than just the usual burning heat. He feels a little friction of steadiness rush through him, too, as though his foundations are being shored up. Wow, Harry says, well, that's wow. Yes, Draco says, and then his voice carefully blank adds, a drink fit for the master of the house. So that's where they're going to start. Harry fights back again the urge to give in to disappointment. It's not as though he was really expecting anything else. Draco, look, I already said it. It's yours. It has been for a long time. I'll sign whatever you want, relinquish whatever I need to. I'm not going to try claim anything or, or take anything away from you. I, I wouldn't do that. And here I was, awash with terror that you might toss me out on the street, Draco snaps. All the neutrality scrubbed from his tone was more typical nettled annoyance. Harry feels muscles he hadn't even realized he was tensing relax. Of course I know that, Harry, you twit. Even if you did want to steal this house back from me, your enormous, unwieldy guilt complex would inevitably get in the way. I'm sorry we'd weep. I'm a terrible person. Everything wrong that has ever happened in history is my fault alone. I don't deserve to live in this beautiful home. I once mistreated and then cruelly booted from you. Is this like a play? Harry says dry, his eyebrows climbing. Am I supposed to do parts, or do I just stand here and clap when you're done talking? What did I could convince you to just stand there and clap there when I was done talking? Draco says in mournful tones. A beautiful dream. If, of course, also a terribly cruel one, since it will never happen, and I'll have to languish here, longing for it, until death takes mercy on me and comes for my soul. Harry snorts and takes another sip of whiskey. Well, at least you don't have any deluded expectations, don't I? Draco says, and his voice is threaded through with such unanticipated vulnerability that Harry jokes his head up, meets his eye. He's expecting them to be wide and terrified, but instead Draco looks defiant, his sharp shin tilted proudly upward, his gaze more challenging than frightened. I... I don't know, Harry says after a moment. It is at least honest. I, I don't know what you're expecting, I suppose. You walk the house, Draco says. Takes a long sip from his glass without breaking Harry's gaze, puts it down on the table next to him when he's done. That's what Creature said. While I was asleep, you walked the house, attic to foundation. That's old magic, you know, Harry. It communicates certain intentions, getting to know someone else's home like that. Harry shrugs, not really sure what Draco's getting at. I, I didn't know. I, I didn't mean to communicate anything, really. What did you mean to do? Draco's voice is sharp. To the extent you ever really meant to do anything beyond get on my last bloody nerve, that is. Harry decides to let that go out of the kindness of his heart. Oh, I don't know. I wanted to make sure it was safe. That's rubbish, and you know it. We both do. Draco's hand reaches out towards his glass again, but then his fingers flex in the air and he drops his arm instead. You did the checks every night while I was awake. That's not what this was, locking up doors and windows and firming up security spells. 
That doesn't mean I'm talking about the other time. Times, maybe. Oh, I don't know. You must have some idea what I mean. Yeah. Harry says, and it comes out as a rasp. Because, yeah, he does. He knows which time Draco is talking about. Tonight he spent climbing and descending the stairs of Grimmauld Place, peeking down every hallway and behind every door. Draco's right. It's bullshit. Completely and without question, to say he did it for the sake of safety or security or anything other than the churning push of his own gut instinct so often relied upon and so rarely caught to give its reason this way. Well, Draco says, crossing his arms now, what did you mean, Potter? Do try to be an adult and use your words, though honestly at this point I would accept interpretive dance if it provided me some enlightenment. I, Harry says, he thinks about those nights, the wooden floor slippery and smooth under his socked feet, the warm, enveloping embrace of a space where he'd once felt strangled, trapped. I wanted to know it as yours. I like it so much better as yours. He admits, dropping his eyes to stare at a spot on the floor. Than I ever did when it was mine, or even Sirius's, and I wanted... I thought I could... I was writing it over, I suppose, in my head, replacing what I had or what I thought I had with... What is? He shrugs, wincing down at the wood grain, and thinks of the way Draco always expects the worst, the way he'll find it in him to doubt any intention that isn't explicitly made clear. It makes Harry's skin crawl at it to do it, but he forces himself to say, oh, I didn't want to miss anything. A any part of it, uh, you. Draco draws in a breath at that last, which hitches a little, but when Harry makes him himself look up, he can't spot panic anywhere, just narrow-eyed ferocity. And why would that be, exactly? Harry drains his glass puts it down on a nearby shelf with a clatter. You know why, he says, and though he wants to drop his gaze from Draco's, he doesn't allow himself the luxury. He watches those grey irises, inscrutable and focused on him with an intensity so consuming that it's nearly intoxicating, even now that Harry's gotten used to it. Oh, I told you I wouldn't take it back and I meant it, Draco. Oh, I still do, and I'm not... I'm not going to change my mind either, and I know it made you angry last time I said it, but, you know, then you kissed me, so I don't really know honestly what's happening, and I I think we probably have to talk about it. Probably should, Draco says. His voice is flat and his face is impassive, and for a horrible second Harry braces himself to hear, I just don't feel that way about you, or... Oh, Potter, you terrible, under-socialized Gryffindor, don't you know it is customary in wizarding societies to mouth-kiss anyone on the brink of death, regardless of your feelings for them? It wouldn't be the worst thing that's ever happened to him, probably. He lived through the Dursleys, after all. He survived the war. He died, that one time. But then, then Draco's mouth curls into the smile Harry's never seen before. All wreckish, wicked implication. His eyebrows lift as his eyes drop, Travel the length of Harry's body in such an unconcealed once over that Harry has to take a deep, steadying breath. Draco says, Or. Harry's not sure which one of them moves first, only that they crash together with an intensity just this side of violence. Their movements almost grappling in the swath of light spilling through the parlor window. One of Draco's hands lands on the side of Harry's neck. As one of Harry seals over Draco's biceps and they're kissing, Draco's mouth warm and whiskey flavored against Harry's own. It's nothing like their enraged, biting first kiss, and such a far cry from the desperate, furious one Draco planted on him yesterday. That Harry's dizzy with it a little. He gasps into Draco's mouth, and Draco presses his advantage, leaning into him, so body bearing down. Harry stumbles even as he shifts to wrap his arms around Draco, eliminate any pesky space that might remain between them, and keep stumbling when Draco nudges him with a shoulder. His back hits the wall, and he tips his head back against us, chokes on his breath, when Draco uses the opportunity to break away, tilt his head, and press his mouth to Harry's neck. Jesus, Harry says, his voice coming a little rough already. His fingers curl to fist around Draco's shirt as Draco nips and sucks at the tender skin below his jawbone, traces the hollows of his throat, 
Jesus, Draco, that... Oh, yes, what is it? Draco breathes against his ear. Do tell, Potter, I'm simply dying to know. Good, Harry says. The word goes funny and strangled halfway through, when Draco drags his teeth across Harry's earlobe. God, really good? Draco huffs out a laughing breath against the side of Harry's neck. I suppose I'd have been insane to expect eloquence from you at a time like this, hmm? Yeah, so annoying, Harry says, aware that it's maybe the least convincing thing he's ever said and not really caring at all. What do you just? Then he slides a hand into Draco's hair, pulls him back far enough that Harry can catch his mouth again. Draco hums against his lips, probably with more words he wants to say, and as he chattering the to get that he is. Harry thinks some fractured thoughts about that as he kisses Draco, remembers something about Hermione and communication being important, and then forgets it again. Forgets he ever thought it. He forgets most everything, honestly, except the exact size and shape of Draco's warm body under his hands, his mouth. The simple fact of it is too much, too impossible, to waste a second thinking of anything else. One of Draco's hands slides up underneath Harry's shirt, the shirt that was just there on the little table in his room at St. Mungo's with fresh jeans and clean trainers and Harry's wand this morning. He hadn't even thought about it at the time, but now he realizes that Draco must have left them, must have come back here and chosen those clothes from amongst Harry's things as the ones best suited for the day. He doesn't know why it goes straight to his dick. The thought that Draco dressed him and is now, actually, honestly, right now, going to undress him, but it does. God help him, it does. He lets out a little groan at the sprawl of Draco's hand across his stomach and feels Draco shudder against him, tightens his fingers in Draco's hair, reaches his other hand down towards Draco's belt, and... The doorbell rings. Are you fucking kidding me? Harry says when Draco breaks away. This is Draco, if that's Pansy, I swear to God, I'm taking her back to Cairo myself, in handcuffs if I have to. This is too much. It's museum's guest, you imbecile, Draco says, but the insult is tempered by the breathlessness of his voice, his bright, irrepressible smile. Oh, I forgot to put out the bloody clothes sign. Great, you can get it, Harry says, already drawing Draco in for another kiss. The tour, he's a tour guide, he can... It's his day off. Draco says, but he lets Harry kiss him again anyway, only steps away when the doorbell rings a second time. God, okay, okay. It's really his day off, Potter. We have to stop. It's his. Why? You got creature to take days off. Just from the museum. Draco says. He's only half a foot away. Harry has to stick his hand in his pocket to keep from reaching for him again. He won't be pried away from his duties to the house for anything God knows I've tried. That's how I know they're guests, because he can tell. Elf magic, you know. He doesn't answer for museum visitors on a day off. That's part of the agreement we drew up. And I had to fight him on it, tooth and nail, and he's probably sitting upstairs twitching every time the bell sounds. Draco cuts himself off abruptly, takes a deep breath, runs a hand through his hair. He's still smiling. Oh, I'm babbling. Usually. Harry agrees, grinning helplessly back, and he's stepping forward, his hand sliding out of his pocket, of their own accord, Draco already leaning towards him, and the bell tolls a third time. Oh my god, Draco says, takes three clean, if painful, steps back. Okay, I have to deal with this, and you have to, to, to go away, because I won't be a person who was caught in flagranti delicto with Harry Potter. I simply refused, it's so embarrassing, there aren't words. You, Harry says, blinking. You're going to, right now, you're going to send me home, so you can give a museum tour? You are the stupidest man on earth, Draco says, throwing up his hands, in the history of earth, even. No, Harry, I'm going to send you upstairs while I tell these unfortunately timed visitors, in my most soothing and professional tones, to get lost as quickly as humanly possible. Is that all right with you, or did you really have your heart set on being caught with your pants down? Rather than answer, Harry closes the distance between them and captures Draco's mouth again, drinking down the annoyed little noise Draco makes as he does so. He kisses Draco until the bell rings a fourth time, and Creature mournfully wails. Please, Master Draco, Creature's begging you. Creature has shown you nothing but kindness for many years. 
from the upstairs landing. Oh, I've got it, I'm coming, Draco calls. To Harry, he says, you go, I'll be only a minute. Harry goes, and endures a horrible moment of eye contact with Creature on the stairs, though thankfully Creature seems to feel the awkwardness too, because he squeaks and vanishes with a crack before Harry has to do anything as horrible as figure out what to say to him about this right now. He proceeds alone up the stairs and onto Draco's private floors, walks quickly down the hall and through Draco's bedroom door. Draco moved back in here a few days ago. He dragged Harry in to see it all fixed up, thrilled and prattling on about the extent of damage and how it really should have taken longer to repair. That day, Harry thought it was torture, standing with Draco next to his massive, comfortable bed and nearly vibrating with all that he was holding back, however glad he was to see the hole in the wall healed up. It's different now, better but weird, too, to be standing in Draco's bedroom like this waiting for this thing Harry's been waiting on, whether he knew it or not, for months now. Years, maybe. More than a decade, by Hermione's reckoning, though Harry's still not sure he's prepared to concede that point. He sits on the bed. He stands up. He paces across the floor. He wonders if he should take his shirt off or something. If that's something a person's supposed to do in situations like this. He sits on the bed. He stands up. He pulls his shirt up over his head. Naturally, it gets stuck. Even more naturally, it is while Harry is trapped in his clutches that he hears the bedroom door shut. He hears Draco say, his voice rich with barely suppressed laughter, Well, well, breakfast and a show. Shut up, Harry says, wrestling his way free of the fabric. Of course, without its helpful shielding qualities, he is confronted with the full force of Draco's scrutiny, and just how exposed he is beneath it. He feels his face heat. I don't... I don't do this often, all right? All right, Draco says. His gaze flicks down to his chest and lingers. His eyes are hungry. Harry swallows. Did you, uh, get rid of the gas and everything? I don't think you really care, Draco says, sounding amusing. Do you? No, Harry admits, and when Draco flushes... Like he hadn't actually expected Harry to agree with him at, oh, I don't think I'd care if they were right outside the door. An exhibitionist streak, Draco says, a little too quickly, his eyes widening as Harry steps toward him. I knew you were feigning being media shy, a devious rouse exposed at last. Little do all these prophets reporters know. Whatever the rest of the sentence was going to be, besides offensive and slanderous, obviously, is lost in the sight of their kiss. The museum is closed now, with a sign up and everything, and the case is solved and Draco hasn't run away screaming yet, so Harry lets himself go slow this time, lets himself kiss Draco the way he hasn't ever been able to imagine himself kissing anyone. Draco's whole body seems to unfold against him, his every touch unguarded and pliant, and Harry reaches down to undo Draco's belt without pulling their mouth apart. Then Draco says, Merlin, Harry, that was so good, and slips his hand down through Harry's hair, strokes it over the nape of his neck, and Harry, he comes so hard and so quickly that it genuinely startles him, the orgasm shattering through him before he even has the chance to process that it's happening. He gasps, head crashing forward to land on Draco's hip, and for a long moment he's too overcome with the release of it to really register that he's come in his pants like an actual fucking teenager and that that is truly and properly mortifying. Potter, Draco says, sounding startled, did you just... Don't you dare say a bloody word, Harry grits out. He wonders if the back of his neck is as hot with humiliation under Draco's hand as it feels to him. Hey, Draco says. He grabs hold of Harry's hair again, pulls his head back so that he can see Draco's face. He's smiling just with one side of his mouth, the expression both warm and almost vulnerable, somehow. His voice is soft. Oh, I wouldn't, or well, oh, I probably would, honestly. You've met me after all. You know what I'm like, but I won't. Okay, Harry says. He swallows, his mouth is dry. Thanks. Sure, Draco says. He repeats the gesture that undid Harry, running his hand over the nape of his neck almost experimentally, and cocks his head when Harry shudders his already spent nerve endings crying out at the casual, proprietary affection of it. You like that, don't you? That's good to know. 
Harry rests his head against Draco's stomach again instead of replying, closes his eyes, just lets himself write the sensation of it a minute. Draco's fingers stroking lightly against his hair, his skin, what he can reach of the line of Harry's spine. Harry thinks he could fall asleep like this, and Draco must think so too, because after a minute, he mutters, We well, could be doing this in bed, it's just stupid, and hauls Harry to his feet with a hand under his arm. Harry lets himself be pushed down across the duvet, lets Draco cast one of those complicated little sex-fluid banishment charms. Harry himself has never mastered, and let his eyes flutter shut when Draco lays down next to him and reaches out to touch him again. There's the same curious air to it, though this time he doesn't go near Harry's neck, runs his knuckles up and down the side of Harry's arm instead. It's just as good, it's almost better, and Harry sighs, happy, his whole body relaxing against the pillows. Harry, Draco says, he sounds something, not as pleased with the world as Harry is. Worrying, even if Harry is, just now not really feeling that worried about much of anything at all. Still, it's enough to make him crack one eye open, we got a little frown curling the edges of Draco's mouth. Draco? Draco's hand still, so he doesn't pull it away. You do understand that it's not, that I'll always be this person, don't you? That you're not going to call me down with sex. People have thought that before, you know, and really almost exactly the opposite is true. I'm obsessive and intense and rude sometimes, and I like things the way I like them, and you aren't going to change that. That's me. And if that's not what you want... He stops, takes a huge breath, and continues, tone so even that Harry aches for him. If that's not what you want, then it's probably best for everyone that we don't. Well, make this any worse for ourselves than we already have, I suppose. Harry frowns against his pillow and then props himself up on an elbow so he can look at Draco properly. As honestly and deliberately as he knows how, he says, and what if what I want is to be with the mad bastard who nearly kicked my door down at 6.30 in the morning over profit article? What if I like that you're obsessive and intense and, yeah, Draco, really rude a lot of the time? What if the last thing I want is to calm you down? Then you're crazy, Draco says after a long pause, but he doesn't look away from Harry when he says it. And Harry doesn't miss the snarl of wild hope in his voice. Completely round the twist. In fact, if that is truly the case, I'm sorry to tell you, it may be impossible for you to live as a normal and respectable member of society. Harry thinks about it for a minute, then he shrugs. Then he smiles. Well, hey, he says, that's all right. After all, who wants to be one of those? To be continued. Following next is the epilogue. Thank you for listening to this chapter of What We Pretend We Can't See by Jism. Read by Ella Max Mabella. If you would like to stay up to date on upcoming chapters and stories, you can follow me on YouTube, AO3 or Spotify.